Welcome to season two of the Project Hope podcast. I'm your host, Jennifer. As many of you know, I am a cult survivor myself. For anyone interested, you can hear the story of how I got in and how I got out in season one, episodes one and two. The beginning of this year, 2023, actually marks my 11 years of being out, and I am so super grateful for the ways my life has unfolded since. I now work with survivors of coercive control, and I'm going to take a moment here to define this term as one of my heart's desires is to help society at large better understand coercive control in cases that are not just culty, but across the globe I view coercive control as a social issue. It's at the heart of cases where women and girls are murdered. We find coercive control in one-to-one relationships that are intimate, in gangs, sex trafficking, and cults of all types. I have a master's in the psychology of coercive control, and I'm just beginning a new element of my career as an expert witness for legal cases that involve coercive control. As a certified trauma professional, I work with survivors. I'm especially excited to be offering a group survivor program for cult and religious abuse recovery. So this is not a support group, but rather a healing program. It's based on my certification in the incredible work of Dr. Jilly Jenkinson, who gathered decades of research on survivors to create a body of work that I would consider to be the most comprehensive and flexible approach I've come across in this field. We will meet every other week for six months, and registration will open in February of 2023 for those interested. Lastly, I am also a research associate at Salford University and explore topics related to coercive control. So let's jump back into a basic understanding of coercive control before I introduce the next episode. Coercive control is a strategic pattern of behavior designed to exploit, control, create dependency, and dominate. The victim's everyday existence is micromanaged and their space for action, as well as potential as a human being, is limited and controlled by the abuser. Initially, the victim may be drawn into the relationship with love bombing and charm. Then gaslighting, isolation, economic control, and financial abuse can take place alongside rules and regulations that are gradually introduced over time and change at the whim of the abuser. The victim knows there are consequences if rules are broken and they apply to the victim rather than the perpetrator, creating a double standard. Over time, coercively controlling behavior erodes the victim's sense of self, their confidence, self-esteem, agency, and autonomy. The abuser creates an unreal world of contradiction, confusion, and fear. It may be helpful to know that 51% of victims do not even know that they are being abused, manipulated, and controlled. Coercive control correlates significantly to serious harm, and in many cases, in intimate partner violence, it precedes homicide. These can be difficult topics to grapple with. So I truly hope that this podcast helps to protect you and those you love with helpful voices and information. If you appreciate the podcast, please let us know by subscribing and comment with kindness. And always think critically, trust your intuition, and be free. Welcome, Erica Borman. It is 
such a pleasure and honor to have you with us today on the Project Hope podcast. Thank you so much, Jennifer, and thank you so much for having me. I'm really looking forward to our chat. <laughs> me too. I've been telling people about it, I have to say. <laughs> well, that means a lot to me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so Erica, just wanted to kind of begin and for the audience, just getting a little bit of an overview of um, a little around your history and, of course, your involvement and arrival at Kwasi Zabantu. Um, and, of course, for the audience, um, in the intro, they will know a little bit about you. But, of course, Erica has an absolutely incredibly written book um, that is just an amazing memoir called uh, Mission of Malice. So... Yeah, thank you, Jennifer. Gosh, it, it, you know, the book has been out for a year now and it never, I'm always amazed when someone tells me that they loved it or that it's incredible because I, yeah, I still have that very big imposter syndrome. Like, who am I to write a book? <laughs> um, but yeah, so I was a little girl. Uh, I grew up in, um, South Africa during the apartheid years. But my parents weren't um, racist. So, I mean, my dad was a missionary and I remember um, sleeping in my sister's room when missionaries from uh, different countries in Africa came to visit, which is not something that would have happened in another white household in South Africa at the time. Having a black person sleep in your own bed, that's like, that would have been completely not on. Ah, but. Okay. So, so even though I grew up in this very racist society, our home itself wasn't racist. Um, but my parents some never discussed politics with us. So I didn't know anything about apartheid at all, um, which I think was definitely not okay. You know, I wish I could go back and like shake my dad and tell him like, you obviously didn't agree with this system but why didn't you ever tell us anything about it anyway we i was around eight years old when my mother went to listen to someone preach now later i found out that my parents marriage was in trouble and my mother was looking for solutions or something and she decided that these people could help her and so began our association with a mission station called Kwasi Zabantu. Now, Kwasi Zabantu is Zulu um, for the place where people are helped. Um, I'll let your listeners decide whether that's <laughs> a misnomer or not. <laughs> um, someone once said to me, yeah, it should be the place where they help themselves to people, you know, like what would that be in Zulu? But, um, and and uh, my parents went to study French in France when I was nine, ten years old, and they left us there for about a year um, without them, um, which was a very traumatic time. And then they came back. And then when I was 15, they decided to open one of South Africa's first multiracial schools at the compound. And because my father was a teacher, they asked him to be the principal of the school. Now, the reason they opened the school was because the South African Department of Education had decided to introduce sex education in 1986 um, oh. into South African schools. And Kwasi Zabantu was like, not our children. You will not teach our children about sex. So they decided to then open their own school where they could decide what we were taught and what we weren't taught. And in fact, in the school then, they would actually glue shut or cut out chapters Bio, in biology textbooks dealing with uh, reproduction of any kind, animal or human, you know. So they definitely very much then controlled what what we saw. But anyway, they but, and the day before school opened, my father died of a heart attack. He was 43 years old. I was 15. He was my whole world. Um, and I had never told him what they had done to us when we were there without them when I was 10 years old. And um, my brother says he also never told my parents. I think we were trying to protect them from their bad decisions as children do, you know. 
and then that that was that that was a truly perfect time um i became a shadow of myself you know uh today i mean i'm i'm not overweight look i can i can stand to lose some weight but i'm not not overweight but i weigh um at about 35 kilograms more than I weighed when I was 20 years old. I was severely anorexic. Um, I would eat like half a slice of bread every second day or so. Um, and I later found out it was because that was the only thing I, in my life that I could control. Anyway, my, my spiritual counselor, because there you have to confess your sins to a human being in order for God to forgive you. And if you die with one unconfessed sin, then you go straight to hell, no matter what your life had been like up until that one unconfessed sin. Um, and he started grooming me, sexually abusing me. And at 21, I didn't know. I thought that they that that I was turning my back on God and on the only true way and because that had been drummed into me since I was eight years old, uh, but I ran away. And then about three years later, I realized that what I had experienced and witnessed was abuse. It took me a while to figure that out. And then about five, six years after I left, I started speaking out against this place because I realized that there are children growing up there and with knowledge comes responsibility. Oh. And yeah, so I went, I wrote an article in 2000 that made big waves in South Africa, but not big enough. Yeah. And then I kind of went quiet for about 18 years just because I thought nobody cared. <laughs> and oh, then I two years ago, together. Interesting. Yeah, so I went quiet for a while. I also needed to heal. I needed to come to terms. I was very angry when I first spoke out, and I think I needed to learn a lot more and 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 live a little bit. But then, anyway, I became an activist again two years ago, and I, now you cannot shut me up. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I know, Erica, we'll go into a little bit around um, that because, oh, that is just, I mean, that's sort of a whole journey in and of itself, isn't it? This kind of movement into speaking out and being a public voice. Yeah. Um, but do you mind if we return a little back into oh. your history? Um I mean, there are so many incredible kind of moments in your story and this journey. Um, so do you mind describing a little bit about, I know you mentioned kind of, you know, that your father really was your whole world at that time. And of course, his passing was a major shift in kind of, I mean, your sense of safety, your sense of being in the world existing. Um, and so I, I'm sort of curious if you, if you mind sharing a little bit about the timing also of having this confession relationship and mm. the passing of your father and what, how did that timing fall? Curious. Yeah, so um, I was alone when someone came and, um, and I, I had fallen asleep. My father had been rushed to hospital and someone told me he'd had a heart attack and then they left me alone. And I had cried and cried and fallen asleep. And then I woke up with one of the, the, actually the second in command there sitting on my bed and he told me that my father had died. Um, and then he took me to the leader, um, Elo Stegen's house, um, where my mother was. But before I was allowed to see my mother, um, Elo, the, I called him Uncle Elo as we all did back then, but now, I mean, no honorific name for him. He's yeah. just Elo. Um, when I don't call him Arsol or something worse, he's <laughs> Elo. Anyway, we, we have Elo. Our, our Am, I names, <laughs> Am I allowed to swear on 
<laughs> oh, <on> yes. your <laughs> okay, cool, cool. So he took me into a room, sat me down, and he said to me, Erica, so your father has died. Do you know what that means? And I said, yes, um, he's gone to heaven. And he said, well, actually, no, what that means is that if you ever want to see your father again and you you have to live a blameless life and you have to confess your sins and you cannot ever not confess your sins and um and then he actually made me confess my sins right then and there oh. um to him uh now confession of look a sin can be a feeling of irritation it can be um looking at a boy it can be talking to a boy it can be um anything you know like 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 even questioning anything around god you know like uh, there's uh, someone has come forward recently where he he asked someone as a young boy he asked someone who made god and he was given such a beating that he couldn't sit for days but we'll get to the beatings but so he made me confess my sins and i know that i often suck sins out of my thumb because like how much sin can one young child commit when there are no there's no tv and there are no books that aren't mission approved there's no magazines there are no radios like the outside world doesn't intrude so and and your your life is completely regimented so just how much can you sin actually anyway so i had to confess my sin and only then did he allow me to um go and go to my mother and and be comforted by my mother Oh. Um, so I was 15 then, it was January 1987, and uh, by December that year, I had turned 16, um, and my mother called me in, um, our school year in South Africa runs from January to December, so it runs, um, we don't start in the middle of the year like, I don't know, the Northern Hemisphere seemed to do. Yeah. And she, she called me in and she said that the school board met and discussed me. And they have decided, because I haven't confessed my sins, a single sin the whole year, um, that they are going to expel me from school. So, you see, I had – my mother wasn't very interested in my life. And she had – they'd made her a teacher. She'd never taught in her life. She was always a homemaker. And then they gave her a teaching position. So she threw herself into her work. I'm sure she was grieving, but we, I lost my mother that year as well. And, and so I was basically just living my life. Um, and that is, and no, so didn't have a counselor. Yeah. That's, that's it, it's such an intense horrible. experience. You know, it, it really is one of those, um, kind of tragedies that <clears throat> it's like the unexpected on top of such yeah. devastation already, you know, of, of yeah. losing your father. And then it is such a bizarre experience to then imagine that the family will come closer together or that you'll have real comfort and connection with the other member of the family or the other parent. And then to kind of discover that they just have to check out for their own survival or whatever it is, you know, coping um, is just, it's such a tremendous, devastating loss, really. It's it's insane. Can I read you something? Please. Um, just to just to bring this. Um, so my my brother, my sister was in her first year of um, undergraduate studies, and my brother was in his final year of schooling, and they both stayed in Johannesburg when I moved down with my parents. So the the chapter is actually called "I Lose My Mother Too." Um, my sister stays with us for those few days surrounding my dad's funeral. So she is given my bed and I'm on a mattress on the floor. I'm not sure where my brother sleeps. I hope he's okay. One night, the pain is unbearable. I cannot hold it in any longer. I know I'm supposed to accept God's will and not grieve too much, but I can't hold in my sobs. I cry and cry and cry. After a while, my mother speaks from her bed. Quiet now, Erica. That's enough. You'll wake your sister. Oh. So that's the comfort I got from my mother, you know. I'm, and like I say, I know she was also grieving, but yeah, that that was that was that was very very hard. 
So then... um, And it's also so interesting, Erica, you know, this has been on my mind recently. So I'll just kind of share it here that, you know, this truly also is the result of spiritual abuse, right? When the texts and the teachings support this um, uh, total dismissal of one's own feelings or ability to move based on feelings in a way that's natural, like a mother loving a child, you know, the affection and how you talk about really just one auntie and uncle were the people that you received a hug from. And that was it. I mean, again, just, you know, for us all to imagine what touch means, you know, and just not even receiving touch. It's really intense, you know, but, but the teachings being used in this way that inhibits our ability to give and move and have life pulsing through in the way that's natural. They, they really frown upon affection there. I mean, they are so obsessed with sex um and lust and how evil it is like i would on a daily basis because we had to go to church every day and on weekends three times a day well sundays often only twice but saturdays three times a day and even as a young child not knowing what lust is at all because there's no sex education yeah um i knew that it was the most evil of all things you know um and they are so obsessed with us that 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 it kind of colors everything. So even just smiling at the at a member of the opposite sex can land you into enormous trouble and beatings. And I mean, so you you I really became a shadow child. But Uncle Manfred, he was Erlo's brother and his wife Evelyn, and they are still alive. And and he was just this teddy bear of a man. And and I don't think he gave a fig what, you know, he saw this young girl who had lost her father and he wanted to hug me and he would hug me. And I really lived for those days. Like, yeah, like you, like you said. So come, come to this December when my mother sits me down and tells me I'm going to be expelled from school. And then she says, and because she has found a home here, Um, if the school expels me, then that means that she also has to expel me from my house. Um, Now, Kwasi Sabantu is in a rural part of South Africa, um, 50 kilometers away from the nearest kind of big town. Um, And she said to me that I would have to pack a little suitcase and make my way up to the road um, and hitchhike and and go and make myself a life somewhere. I was 16 years old. I still had two years of schooling left. I mean, I had no qualifications. I I had no money. Like it, it just this. And so, of course, that 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 scared the bejesus out of me. This um, is so interesting. So I actually have a question about this, Erica, um, because of course, you know, it's quite easy for me knowing the the cultiverse. The, the big wide world of, you know, culty groups that are out there. Of course, um, I, I can understand that there's such sort of mental entrapment that parents actually give children away or are fine kind of excommunicating their children. But help me a little here to paint this picture, because what was interesting to me about this is I wondered and because this was part of the culture, right, where other children, I mean, it's um, uh, your lovely, lovely friend, um, who's been, people. she, um, she, of course, shares a similar story where her father kind of drives right past her as she's leaving. And she just can't, as a young woman, she can't even believe it. She really thinks that her father's going to pick her up around the corner or something, you know, I mean, the innocence of a child's mind. So it's, it's interesting to me though, can you help paint the picture of what you might imagine the parents are thinking around this one? Because you truly don't have a place to go. So 
how does that play out in the parental mind that this is okay, that there isn't that impulse to at least set the child up with a home to go to if you excommunicate them? Or how does that work in the mind of that group? So, you know, I, 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 I also cannot fathom it. And, and yeah. one of the reasons that I am childless is because in my 20s and 30s, I was too scared of turning into my mother. And I didn't want to, without intending to fuck up a child, <laughs> to be honest. So I cannot fathom that. But here is what I think and what I've heard from other parents who have left. Um, everything is geared towards making sure your child goes to heaven, right? Yes. And because I was, by not confessing my sins to a human being, I was turning my back on God. She had to turn her back on me because God wouldn't want her to have anything to do with me. It would it would put her salvation in question if she actually tried to support me or be, even be nice to me when I was evil or when I was choosing to turn my back on God. Yes. So her salvation would be at risk, but also in making it as hard as possible for me, she would be trying to turn me back to God. Yes. Okay. So that I would, I would, and that is what happened. I got myself a counselor and I started confessing my sins. They allowed me to stay provided that I got a counselor and I started confessing my sins, which is what I did. Yes. So, so it worked. I have another friend. I call her Jessie in my book. Um, her parents were extremely harsh on her and her brothers. Uh, her father would, would beat them. But like badly, like like hard, like like hectic beatings. And today, her parents have both left many years ago. And today, she says the person who cries the most about those beatings in their family is her father. He finds it very hard to forgive himself. But here is what he told her: he genuinely believed them when they said that if you don't beat your children, you are sending them to hell. Yes. The only way to get your child into heaven is to beat them whenever they did anything wrong. And this is also the place that believes you have to break the spirit of a child by the age of three. Oh. So they got hold of me when I was eight. So, yeah, they had a bit of a harder time breaking my spirit. But so everything, I mean, the children's lives there are so stilted and so... Like there's no exuberance. You very seldom hear a child laughing or screaming as they run and play. Those sounds are just not there. They're just not there. Children are little adults that have to sit still from when they are toddlers. They are not allowed to fidget in church. Um, yeah, it's just, yeah. Amazing. Yeah, but I, yeah the, it's, it's. And this is this is the root of my activism is yes. because of the children, yes. you know. I feel for the parents, and and I do. I, I've come to understand also with the um, uh, attending the conference of the Ixa conference and 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 listening to a lot of podcasts and listening to your podcasts and everything. I have come to understand. I really think that there are two groups, and we can help each other in that. But there is a definite difference between someone who was in a group as a child with no agency and someone who was duped into joining a group because they thought it was they were doing the right thing and the good thing but they were an adult and they had some agency in that choice so I've come to understand that there's a fair amount of difference in I think the because people who joined cults as adults they often speak about having to reclaim their identity and having to find the person they were before they joined the cult again, you know, and, and reconnect with that person. But for us children, who is that person? 
Like, like we, we, who is, we don't have really, okay. I was, I was eight years old. I'm very lucky. Uh, very lucky that I had eight years of normal life before. So in a sense, I could kind of reconnect back. But if you're born into it, like, what is your pre-cult identity? Is do you even have a pre-cult identity? So those those are those are questions that 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 I find um, interesting. You know, yeah. Well, it's yeah. interesting because that is a lot of the post-cult recovery work that we do with the second generation, um, as well as mm-hmm. first. But it is a little different, as you said, in terms of kind of the touch point inside internally when you have known a childhood of complete suppression and trying to fit into some identity that is group approved, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, So it's interesting, Erica, because actually, as I read your book, what I felt in your writing was sort of this weaving of discovery kind of back into your history to touch into that reclamation, you know, being able to kind of feel where you were being with yourself and sorting through, you know, what wasn't you and where that natural you was kind of coming or peeping out or uh, saying a little something or, or in your internal world, you know, I mean, I found it absolutely fascinating that we get to journey with some of that internal dialogue as your young woman. And this is where I see your real personality come through, right? That you have already solved and kind of determined that you are a sinner at that baptism. And so the baptism story becomes this really interesting moment. Maybe you could share a little bit about that, but I love these conclusions that you've made in your young mind, you know, that just sort of capture this, this determination and intelligence. And, you know, you just see it through the, the layers of the, of the uh, pressure that's on you as well. Yeah. Yeah, you know, um, (laughs) that, that baptism, I mean, I think I opened the chapter with saying the day of my death dawns bright and clear because I was convinced (laughs) I was going to die that day because I was getting baptized and I knew that my life wasn't right with God the way that they expect me to. And then, of course, it's God himself, well, and or who everyone there regards as God, who is the oak who actually baptizes me. And I was convinced I was going to be struck by lightning. And then he dunks me and he, who is God's mouthpiece, doesn't know that he shouldn't be baptizing me. So that was actually the very first time, I think, that I recall a slight thing of, hang on, he baptized me? I know that I am not one of them. God doesn't speak to me like... like. Uh, I, I, I'm evil. I know that I'm evil. So how can this man of God baptize me? How do? How come God didn't tell him that's a rotten egg? Don't baptize her. So that was the first time I think there was where there was a little bit of a hang on. But yeah, wow. yeah, right. Like the yeah. the veil gets parted just a tiny bit mm-hmm. into being able to question. Yeah. Yeah. People, I've, I've heard other people, other ex cult members explain it as in the shelf, you know, and you, and something goes on the shelf that doesn't quite make sense. And eventually, I think that shelf breaks. And then that is when you, when you run. Whereas for me, that shelf only broke after I'd left already. I left because I was trying to get away from this counselor that now, okay. So back to the, back to finding the counselor. Yeah. Um, So, um, <laughs> I kind of auditioned counselors then because strangely well, I enough, this say, is what- <laughs> I don't mean to interrupt you, but that was another moment for me that I went, there's Erica. There she is. Yeah. That she freaking chose the person that was the intellect that knew about yes. worldly things, you know? Yes. So, so th- this is weird to me, considering just how controlling they they are. That I was allowed to choose my own counselor. 
So I auditioned two other people. One was a woman and, and one was a man. And they were just so cold. And, and I was like, how on earth am I going to? Oh, and the other thing. Okay, so so here's the thing about me is I, is I was a charming little girl, right? Um, uh, adults would often say, oh, isn't she sweet? Or, oh, isn't she cute? So I knew that I was charming. But these two, I couldn't charm. <laughs> so, so a little bit of a little bit of um, um, self reflection there. I, I'm actually only realizing that as I'm saying this to you now. I mean, I wrote a whole book, and I've only just had the realization that they sat there stony faced, and and on some level, I must have known that I I can't charm them. So I'm going to have to actually confess real sins, you know, and um, like I couldn't charm my way through these confessionals. But then there was this this extremely articulate man, Muzi Gunene, and um, he was a married man. He was married to the sister of one of the the, the main leaders. And um, he, but when he preached, there would always be some history or something. You know, it wasn't just doom and gloom and damnation. There was in, the, also doom and gloom and damnation because I don't think. There is a single sermon that you can find there that doesn't have damnation in it. Um, but also interesting. So I asked him if he would be my counselor and he said yes. And so I started going to confess my sins to him. And boy, what a revelation. He's a black man and he is the one who taught me about apartheid. He's the one who taught me that there were benches and beaches where white there was whites only. Like, and if you were not white, you couldn't go to that beach. You couldn't sit on that bench. You couldn't go to that toilet. You had to use a different window to buy a train ticket. Um, and those are the small indignities, right? Then there's the the, the 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 big ones, which is like if you were a black person and you were in a white area, you had to carry what they call a dompas that that gave you permission to be in a white area after dark like um and that's yeah so so he he then educated me about apartheid and this was in 1988 so end of 1988 beginning 1989 so we are still in apartheid sure it's loosened a little bit and black and white people are actually allowed to have sex now i think I wonder when that was scrapped. But yeah, it was actually against the law to have sex with someone who wasn't um, your own race. You know, the, 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 it, it was the most horrific, horrific um, system of oppression. Uh, yeah. Um, there are lots of people who know a lot more than I do, obviously. But anyway, he educated me about this and and we would have long discussions And because history was one of my favorite subjects. So mm. we would like and then of course i would confess sins as well um and he he basically took the place of my father he be, he absolutely became my father figure he had two children at the time and his little girl miriam she had been born with muscular dystrophy oh yeah so she was very disabled um and and i would spend like two or three hours a day with her teaching her english and and massaging her little limbs they were so skinny um because she couldn't stand she couldn't walk but she needed to be massaged and and moved just to make it easier so i would spend a lot of time with her completely fell in love with her um and yeah and then it was my father's birthday um, on the 24th of August, 1988. I had just turned 17 on the 8th of August. And it, it, was, it was the second birthday without my dad. And um, I went to him and confessed my sins. But then I actually just ended up crying and crying and crying and crying. Um, and we got up and he gave me a hug. Now, that is... I'm sure something that's not allowed. Well, I know it's not allowed, but it was so welcome. You know, I I come from a very affectionate family. Like my dad, we were always affectionate. I sat on his lap as a little girl, you know, held his hand. Um, like there was never a lack of affection in our home. And then suddenly here I am, I've lost my dad, I've lost my mother. And the only person who 
two people who give me hugs are Uncle Manfred and Auntie Evelyn. And, and yeah, so here is this man that I already idolize giving me a hug. And it felt so good. And so that became the norm then. We would always give each other a hug because the thing is, is the counselors are alone with their counselees. I don't know what you would call me, but the confessee. There's nobody around. We're alone in a room. Yeah. So nobody can see that he's giving me hugs either. Um, and at some point he, he says to me, you know, you should probably not tell anybody about this because nobody will understand. But you know what? We have a special relationship. So, and then of course, yeah. I'm a little frog in the water. Yeah. Starts with the hugs. Welcome. I welcome the hugs. I love the hugs. Yeah. The hugs start getting a bit tighter and a bit longer and, his hand starts roaming, which feels uncomfortable, but I'm so grateful to be in his embrace. And he's a man of God, you know, right. that, that this has to be okay. And then he would peck me on the mouth. Now, in the Afrikaans culture, we greet people by pecking them on the mouth. I mean, I, I know lots of people will think, ooh, yuck. But, I mean, I greeted my uncles, my cousins, my, you know, we greet each other. Peck on the mouth. Yeah. So that wasn't that wasn't extraordinary for me. It was odd that it was him because in at Kwasisabantu that doesn't happen. Right. But then one day he stuck his tongue in my mouth. And that felt that was an absolute invasion and I did not like it. And I didn't know what to do because but he's a man of God. And also I'd never had any sexual education. I mean right. but but to show you the extent of my um of my ignorance, and you'll right. know this from reading my book, is when when I started getting my period, I thought I had stomach cancer, right? Yeah. Because uh, because there was this stuff all and and I would wash my panties very furtively in the bath so that my mother wouldn't see because I thought she'd think that I'd soiled my pants but I knew it wasn't I hadn't soiled my pants but what I didn't know what this was right and so one day we we, we were never allowed to lock the bathroom door um I think she always thought we got up to nefarious things but um uh, we were never allowed to lock the bathroom doors so the one day she came in while I was having a bath and she found me like furiously scrubbing my knickers. Um, and she said, Oh, okay. Come and speak to me when you're out the bath. Now, when my mother called us into her room or called me into her room, and um, that was like, Ooh, shit, what have I done now? So I sat down and then she prayed and look, she always prayed before she gave us a hiding or something. So red flags, red flags. And then she said to me, so, this has happened to you now. You, you, this happens to you as you grow older. It's blood. It's going to happen once a month. It's called a period. Here is a pack of pads. You put it in your panties like this. This is how you dispose of it. And now you really have to stay away from boys. And then she prayed again. And that was the extent of my education about my body, about what was happening. I remember at school, girls were laughing and they said something about the, a hole. And oh, I was right. like, what hole? They were like, yeah. And, and I was like, what hole? And then they were like, you know, that one. And I was like, oh, yeah, that one. <laughs> I didn't know that I had a hole, you know, because I wasn't allowed to touch myself down there. Like that had been ingrained in me, you know. And my mom once asked me, also sat me down, prayed with me and said, she wants to know, am I playing with myself down there? And I'm like, how can I play with myself down there when I'm not allowed to go there? Like, no, of course I'm not playing with myself down there. So and anyway, so that you would even know to not, or you know, it's it's really so amazing how the teachings get in the psyche like that. It's like, do you even you know, remember just, being told that? It's like one day you just know that that's the that's the off limit thing. Yeah, I don't remember, but but so here's something that didn't make it into my book, and I've never publicly spoken about it. Mm. Um, when my parents left, to, left us there to go to France, um, the there was a, a family who had daughters that I would sometimes visit. They had a home, and one day th they were a lot 
freer like the girls bath together and that which you know like you're you're supposed to avoid nakedness at at any cost and I was 10 years old and I remember um the mother saying oh Erica just jump in the bath um with them and I remember getting in the bath and and looking at them seeing them naked and realizing that these dark brown spots that I have down there are not on them and then realizing with absolute clarity that it's dirt that has collected on me there because I haven't washed myself. Oh, because you didn't know, you couldn't even touch yourself, wash yourself. No, so I didn't wash myself. And the shame I felt because they could obviously see me and the shame I felt that they must think that I'm just this dirty, dirty girl who doesn't wash herself and then realizing that actually I do need to take the face cloth and, and wash there, you know, because they are clean. So obviously it's, it's okay to, to, to kind of wash myself there, you know? Oh my yeah. goodness. Yeah, no. It's such a tender, <laughs> tender story and moment to really just show that, you know, it's like, you're 10 years old and just have no idea. I mean, and then, you know, you put everything else into context and just, you just don't have any platform to land on with any understanding. It's just. No, no. And, and, and I mean, like it was very definitely like a topic that was off limits with with my mother you know like there's no ways that i could go to her and say um i'm not sure i chose the right counselor he's making me feel uncomfortable you know because he's a man of god and we've it's been indoctrinated into me that as a woman or as a young girl grow, becoming a woman i am absolutely inferior and that men of god are infallible um And then can I ask also, Erica, was there any ability to connect with your sister or any, what was kind of happening there? No. So my sister um, did eventually uh, come and live at Kwasi Sabantu and um, she claims that we shared a room for a year, but yeah, not, not a whole year, a little bit, but, but, but not a whole year, but, um, she then got proposed to and married a man that that I absolutely despised. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And I remember, so this is a bit later on, but I remember um, uh, she had just given birth to her first child and I was in their room and um, my sister said, "We, my sister and I were laughing, but he was there and we, she was saying, no, she she doesn't run anymore. And I said, yeah, no, you don't want to make milkshake, you know, cause she was breastfeeding. So I thought that was funny. <laughs> yeah. He was so, so horrified that I could joke about something like that because obviously it concerns breasts and, you know, breasts are also not spoken about or, you know, yeah. Um, but yeah, so, so for a while there, I thought my sister and I were, were close, but, um, but you can't trust anyone there because oh. they, if you know of someone's sin and you don't confess their sin, in other words, you don't snitch on them. Yeah. You are as guilty as they are and you are also going to go to hell. So if I were to confide things in my sister and then two weeks down the line, she sat in church, God spoke to her and she went and confessed what I had told her, because that's what's expected, then I would get into trouble. And so you, you, you can't have friendships or close relationships with anybody because they can snitch on you at any time. And also, I don't want to put her salvation at risk, you know, by telling her my doubts, because then I would be putting her salvation at risk. And then her going to hell is on me, you know. So, yeah. <laughs> Again, spiritual abuse kind of entrapping, right? Where you can't even, there's sort of no way out, especially at the young age, you know, it's really. And 
and and you know your your counselor was never your parent your counselor was always someone not in your family and you were taught to run to your family uh, to run to your counselor and i later found out from people who have also left as adults that um that they were not encouraged to discuss things as husband and wife they were the counselor was the person that you had to discuss things so they they insert themselves into relationships between parents and children between siblings between husband and wife um because they have to because they have to control you so your counselor becomes like god's voice and yeah yeah that there's you there's no fostering of trust or or a, a, a close relationship. You know, it always amazes me couples who leave, Kwasi Sabantu, and who actually stay together. Um, I, I always find that amazing, and I'm so happy for them. But that they have each other, you know, and that they obviously do love each other. But I, I always find that quite amazing um, when couples leave and they end up staying together. Right. Yeah. Well, it's truly the test is the leaving, right? Because then there's a whole new thing to sort through and discover together. I mean, who are the two of you in this new state and who might you become? I mean, that is a journey and an experiment to an extent, right? It's quite amazing. Yeah. 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 And so... I'm also just thinking about this kind of thread of family for you. So within the Kwasiza Bantu experience that really you're unable to connect with your sister and Chris, your brother, but then there's this interesting element that comes into your story around. It's so fascinating that, that these other family members kind of play in your uh, safe, My aunt, aunt safe aunt. landing, safe harbor. Yeah. So my uncle Chris, he was 12 years older than my dad. Um, and I never really knew him. Uh, ah, is he, he your had... brother's namesake? Was your brother yes. named after him? Oh, yeah, it's a family name. Steve. Yeah. Huh? yeah. It, it just feels so significant because of how important the relationship is with your brother and that this happens to be kind of the uncle that's the little beacon of light, you know, yeah. interesting. We call we call my uncle Chris one and my brother Chris two when we speak <laughs> among ourselves just to, just to know which Chris you're talking about. So Chris one is my uncle yeah. and he, the, he him and Janet, his wife, had immigrated many years ago. Um he was actually one of South Africa's youngest professors, and uh, mm. but he couldn't reconcile himself with um, with apartheid, and uh, he left South Africa. And by the time I started writing to him, I started writing to him because my sister was writing to him, um, and and she had started writing to him before my father died. But um, after my father died, I also sent him a letter. He sent us a beautiful letter and I sent him a letter and then we started corresponding. They, he, they were living in Sweden at the time. And then he came to South Africa for a visit um, after many, many, many years of not being in South Africa. And uh, we drove up to uh, Pretoria where um, some of my father's sisters lived um, and the whole Bornman family got together. And that was the first time I met, I, well, I mean, I might have met him as a little baby or a girl, but but I don't remember. That's the first time I remember meeting him. Yeah. And I remember the first like hour or so, I could hardly look at him because he, my father was quite tall. He's not as tall, but his mannerisms, his his way of holding his head, everything was like, this was my dad, you know, it was oh. so amazing. Um, really? Yeah, the, those those traits kind of ran in families because my 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 dad and him were never close. He was twelve years old when my dad was born, and he was sent. They were born in Kenya, and he was sent to boarding school in South Africa. So, him and my dad, I mean, they had a relationship, but not a not a close relationship, and yet their mannerisms were so the same. And he then came down to KwaZulu Natal. At the time, it was only Natal. Um, 
uh, it's changed its name after we got democracy. Um, and uh, he apparently went back and told my aunt Iris, who's my dad's sister, who lived about 120 kilometers away from Kwasi Sabanti. And I don't do miles. I'm sorry. I don't know how far that is in miles. But anyway. Oh, no. um, sh- <laughs> Google it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he came, the, he then actually came to visit us at Kwasi Sabanti. And apparently on his return um, to Peter Marisburg, he said to my aunt, we've got to get Erica out of there. And that is when he, him and Janet offered me, because I was learning French and German. um, And he said to me, you know, the best place to learn French and German is in France and Germany. So I want to buy you a ticket to Europe and I'm going to buy you a URL pass for three months. And you can travel around and just soak up the language and everything. Um, and I was 20 years old. And uh, my mother wasn't happy, but she allowed me to go because Kwasi Samantu had a huge European contingent. And she said, as long as I am always with someone from Kwasi Sabantu. Yes. But this did mean that my that my visit to Europe got extended because I was staying with various families. Um, and then Chris and Janet asked me, what do I want to do with my life? And they were like the first adults who ever asked me that. And I said, I really want to be a translator for the United Nations, you know. Yeah. And then they said, okay, well, the best place in, in – you should go study at Maastricht University in the Netherlands, study translation there, and we'll pay for your university costs, but you're probably going to have to get a job just to help with living expenses. I phoned my mother, so excited, because this is like a dream come true, and she said, no, Erica, you promised me that you are returning in January. This is your promise. You made that promise. You keep that promise, and you are coming back in January. By now, I had just turned 21, which meant that I was an adult, but I didn't know that (laughs) because at Kwasi Sabantu, if you're a, if you're a girl, if you're a daughter, you remain under your parents' authority until the day you get married. So if I had gotten married, if I had stayed there and gotten married at the age of 30, I would have been, um, my mother would have had control over my life until such day time as I get married. And then I would have become gone into the control of my husband so I didn't know that I could say to my mother you know well sort off you horrible woman who wants to control me I'm 21 I'm an adult I can make my own decisions and I'm staying and I'm going to go study at Maastricht I didn't know that I could I didn't know yeah. that I didn't have to listen to her so I listened to her and I returned to South Africa yeah and um and then I was there, and and when you come back from a trip or something, you always have to go and greet the important people. Um, apparently, just by the by, during the COVID pandemic, that's how COVID spread in the mission because someone came back from a trip and went and greeted everybody. And yeah, but that's hearsay. <laughs> like I wasn't there, obviously. Um, and so I had to go and greet Muzi, and he pinned me against the wall and kissed and fondled me and and I I that was I was I'd been like there for two days or so so on my third day I phoned my aunt Iris in Peter Maritzburg and I said Tani Iris can I come visit you and she said come my child and then I had to convince my mother that I was just going for the weekend even though I knew that I wasn't coming back because I didn't have a license I'd never learned how to drive we didn't have a car so I needed her permission to get a lift to go to Peter Marisburg to go and visit my aunt. Mm. And if she had suspected <laughs> that I wasn't coming back, there's no ways she would have granted me permission to yeah. leave. So I packed a tiny little bag. And when I got to Peter Marisburg, I just broke down and I said to my aunt, I can't go back there. And she said, you don't have to, you can stay with me. And I phoned my brother who was in a nearby city and because uh, we had conscription back then into the army, so he had been conscripted into the army. Oh, and so he, yeah, yeah. I actually he had was wondered of- about that because I think in the book, I don't know that you say exactly kind of how he landed out, you know, and and I actually wondered about that. Yeah, he'd been conscripted, 
um, for two years. Um, he was one of the last um, of our young men who was conscripted for two years. After him, it turned to one year, and then eventually it was abolished. But then he opted to stay on for another two years in the army because my mother wanted him to come and teach at Kwasi Saban too. And he was like, fuck no. Yeah. Okay, I'm putting words in his mouth. Um, and so he opted to stay on in the army for another two years just so that he wouldn't, you know, have to go and live at Kwasi Saban too. So anyway, he was in the army and he drove up and I told him a little bit. I didn't tell him everything that Muzi had done, but I told him enough and he was like, no. And then on the Sunday when I was meant to return to Kwasi Saban to Iris phoned my mother and I sat next to her like shivering oh. as she told my mother that I was staying. Yeah. So those are my, the, the, it was, it was my uncle, Chris, Chris one and Janet, his wife. And then my aunt Iris, both my parents, um, my dad's brother and sister who without them, I would still be there. I would, well, no, I'd be dead. Um, but I would have married a man that I didn't love. I would have had his children. Um, and, um, yeah, I would have lived a life of what's it? Quiet desperation. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. She gave me a home. Dare I say like your sister. Yeah. Yeah. My sister married a man who is such an inadequate man, but and you know, Dr. Yanya Lalik speaks about bounded choice. Oh yeah, um, where you think people have a choice. Like she had a choice whether she she could marry him or not, but it's not really a choice. You know, right. it's a bounded choice. That's you, right. You, 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 there's no free will when you're in a cult, and you can't even see out of it. Especially if you're poor, and and they keep us poor. You know, except for the leaders who enrich themselves, but. They they deliberately, I also think, keep their followers and the people who live there poor. You know, they give us a roof over our heads and they give us food and we have to be happy with that. Um, and and uh, but but th that means that you can't leave, especially once you're married and you have children. Now, imagine you have four children because like they don't do uh, birth control. So imagine you have a whole brood of children that you are responsible for and you want to leave, but you have no savings. You have, you probably don't even have a bank account. You might have a bank account if you're lucky. You don't have property. You don't own your own car. You, you have nothing. How do you leave? How do you leave? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if we spoke about this, Erica, but it reminds me so much of um, that there are some really incredible docu-series or documentaries that have come out about the ultra orthodox community in the Brooklyn area in New York. Yes. It's it, it really reminds me so much of that, you know, to be married so early so the women are so young and then they become mothers right away and then the children are seen as the hope of the community and the community is so isolated that people sometimes don't even speak English you know, that they're speaking Yiddish. Um, and the education, of course, is very minimal. It's, you know, what the leaders of that community want it to be, um, which is a whole interesting kind of political situation, even in terms of New York and how it ties into, you know, votes for political positions and that community has a lot of people. So it's just fascinating. Anyhow, I don't mean to derail us. Yeah. And you've been taught to fear the outside world. You've been taught that they don't understand you. They ridicule you. They make fun of you. They don't understand you. They hate you. And now to think that you might need to ask someone from the outside world for help, I, I, you probably can't even compute that that is a possibility. And then you read people who leave and you read their accounts and and they find that people are so friendly and open and loving and giving and helpful and how that is just such a, like, my I, I was going to ask you if you had that experience, even being, you know, with those moments of family and it's like that, I mean, I even had that experience, oddly enough, not being second gen um, and working in the world, quote unquote, um, but because I couldn't go really deep with those relationships, I think I couldn't 
feel into how untrue that all was. Uh, but, but it was a conversation with my brother that kind of opened things up for me where I started to question, wait, this is a highly emotionally intelligent conversation that we're having. I've been told that everybody outside doesn't have the depth that we do. And yet here's my bro who is actually not at all what they've told me he is. And there, there Mm. was the little break, you know? Yeah. You know, uh, some things that that really highlights that for me is so this lot were okay i have to say allegedly um helping the apartheid government mm. um oh yes I, I know it's true so this this practice of confession right yeah so you know that there was a liberation fight happening in south africa and the ANC was one of the organizations that was leading this political fight for the emancipation of all South Africans. Um, and uh, so was the UDF, but but the ANC in particular, and they established a military wing, um, where they actually then took up arms. Um, and then Kwasi Tabantu would do these big, preaching things and people would feel God coming down on them. And then of course you have to confess all your sins. And honestly, when you convert to Kwasi Zabantu, you literally have to go back to your childhood and remember everything you've done wrong. And then you have to write letters to people to apologize for, I don't know, drinking the milk in their fridge that without them giving you permission or whatever, you have to make restitution for everything. So, you know, yay, yippee, I love apologies. It's good and everything, but, but literally that is what they do. Yeah. And they would apparently get these ANC cadres then who were fighting against the government and obviously doing so secretly. Yeah. They would confess and this would come out in confession and um, Kwasi Zabantu <laughs> would pass that information and the people on to the apartheid military intelligence, the security forces. Oh, um, interesting. And- I wanted to actually ask you about this because I know it comes up a little bit in the uh, news. Is it News 24? Or Yeah, in, in their 24. reporting yeah. that some of this came up. And I was actually very curious about it. So that legacy kind of began around that time. And then has that political connection kind of carried through? Oh, they are now in bed. Allegedly. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, We have the premier of KwaZulu-Natal. Well, he's just been deposed, which I kind of think is a bit of karma because two weeks or so before he was deposed, he um, went and did a whole well-publicized visit to Kwasi Zabantu. And that is despite the fact that everyone knows that they are being investigated for abuse. So no, they're in bed now with very comfortably aligned with the, with the ANC government. Um, So, but, but from the, from the pulpit, I remember them preaching against Nelson Mandela, which we in South Africa, we affectionately call him Madiba. Yes. They they yes. preached against Madiba. They preached against against Archbishop Desmond Tutu also. Oh, wow. Um they were very virulently wow. opposed to him because he was an advocate for the unification of churches and for churches to work together. Oh. And they said and they were absolutely anti-communist. I mean they showed us horrific movies um of what's going to happen to us when the communists come. And there was a, a rebellion. That's when the Sharpeville massacre took place, where the police opened up fire on on um, children and oh. killed them. Um, and um, Steve Biko was assassinated. Oh yeah, I think he was he was killed in custody. Um, and I mean, oh, what what a loss to South Africa if that man had lived, you know. Oh. Um, but so they preached against him, and when they beat the rebellious black children, they would. They would tell them that they're beating the spirit, the spirit of Biko out of them. So they were virulently opposed to the liberation of South Africa. Um, wow. And they preached against Bishop Tutu and against Madiba and obviously against Steve Biko, but he was dead by that stage. And then when I got out into the world, 
and in the lead up to the first um, election, the fair election in South Africa, um, I was listening to Madiba speak. I was listening to Bishop Archbishop Desmond Tutu speak. And I was reading about them and they are these incredible men. And, and there was that dissonance between what I had been taught about them, that they were pure evil and, and, and they, they, they want to destroy South Africa. And then I'm hearing them speak and, and, and that is not true at all. And that's when that's, that was, that was when those cords were being snipped, when I could, see the reality of the man that Madiba is and the reality of the man that Archbishop Tutu is um, juxtaposed with what I had been taught about them. And I could see for myself that they had been lying about them. Yeah. And, and it's always so fascinating to me when in the these unhealthy groups that are typically totalitarian and usually patriarchal, it's so fascinating to me that these men go against figures that actually represent what kind of the spiritual should and align with individuals who have no morality and and they are so ungodly i mean i mean trump is absolutely the antithesis of what christians say they they want to be and they believe in and and yet they support him but but i think it's because he will keep their world safe yeah and 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 somebody else may not keep their world safe and may help their wives realize that um they don't have to be obedient and may help their girl children realize that actually, no, I I can wear short skirts if I want to. And I don't have to pledge my purity to my father. Well, not that they do that, but I mean like that 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 whole that's just so disgusting. Fathers giving their daughters purity rings, like Wah. um that's just gross. But anyway, so so someone like Trump, as vile as he is and as lacking in humanity as he is. He will keep their status quo. And that's why they support him. Not, I think, that's what I think. And because secretly he's actually living everything, all their values. They they just won't acknowledge that it's their values, you know? Well, that's what I'm talking about kind of on that deeper level um, is that that there is some resonance with those people, you know? It's just... It's so obvious and bizarre and, you know, just in some ways, I I don't have the right terminology, Erica, but it's like a a beautiful display of the horror of it all right there. Absolutely. Absolutely. For sure. For sure. Um, They aligned themselves with one of the worst, um, regimes political regimes the world has ever come up with and now they are aligning themselves with a government that unfortunately is extremely corrupt so yeah 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 so So, i guess in that way their pivoting also makes sense yeah yeah we'll focus a little bit more on the Questies Ubuntu and what's happening there kind of present day in a minute. So let's just enter back into your leaving and you're kind of waking up to what's what has been. Um, and do you mind just kind of sharing a little bit about the impact of that with your mother, your sister, kind of what's happening in the family dynamic? Yeah. So well, the first person, because um, obviously I had done something terrible now. Look, there are members of Kwasi Sabantu who don't live and work on the compound, but I had a job there. I was teaching English to little kids, um, and I chose to leave without the blessing of the leader. So he called me in on one of my visits back to my mom because I was still trying to repair 
my relationship with my mother. Um, and he called me in and he said, so Erica, is this God's will for your life? And I kind of bravely said, well, I didn't consult God on this one. Um, <laughs> And he exploded. He's he's the only person in in my childhood who was who had righteous anger. So for all of us, getting angry was a grievous sin that we had to immediately confess. But when he got angry, it was a righteous anger. So he was allowed to get as angry as he wanted and like shout and da da da. Anyway, so he got very angry, and then he told me that I would never be happy, that my future husband would sleep around with other women. Because, of course, they think that's the worst thing that can happen to a woman. Um, and then he turned around and he said, God's curse is now on your life. It's amazing yeah. to me how this happens, too, in the leaving process, that there has to be some verbal curse or shaming on the individual that then they're, they hopefully carry for the rest of their lives. <laughs> Thank God and healing then, is possible. <laughs> and then my brother-in-law told me that I was not allowed to have any contact with my nieces because it's his God-given duty as their father to keep them away from evil and from Satan. So sad. And then my mother and my boyfriend was actually with me. I took him with me to Kwasi Savanti. <laughs> I write about that in one of the chapters. I mean, I, I really don't know where I got the balls from, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, and then on another visit, my mother said that if I wasn't prepared to accept Adolf Stegen as my spiritual leader, then she couldn't be my mother anymore. Yeah. And so, yeah, she basically said that I wasn't her daughter anymore. So, um, but I still had my brother and I had my aunt Iris, but, but, and you know, this is the wonderful thing, Jennifer, it's this podcast. It's the whole, the whole community that I have found recently um, of people who are helping others heal from cultic abuse and from spiritual abuse and coercive control. And when I ran away from Kwasi Sabantu, it was January, 1993 pre-internet days I mean I didn't even have a cell phone I had I had my brother's support and I had my aunt's support and that was that was it um and and I'm so grateful that now there is this huge community there online um and in person just just resources that people who leave and who are trying to make sense of what happened to them they can now find podcasts like yours and and others and I I just think that is absolutely incredible yeah it is an incredible community. And I think also, especially as we're seeing, which I believe, you know, you're kind of having a similar experience with the Kwasi Zabantu community, where now we're really seeing, you know, a whole second generation, those who were born in leaving. Mm -hmm. um, and that really is a, a huge surge that's happening. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but the community yeah. is so important, isn't it? It's been such a surprising, kind of joyful um, thing for me to discover. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, and I've spoken to um, some other friends recently, and they also they are just like inhaling these podcasts and and um, and reading these books, and and it's it's really amazing. Yeah. So I know that also your relationship with Chris, as we kind of get a flavor of it throughout the book, um, that he really is a huge support to you kind of in this journey and the unfoldment of. Can I, can I read you the dedication of my book? Please. I dedicate this book to my brother, Chris Boardman. You are my rock and my steadfast source of unconditional love. You helped me even when you needed help yourself. You have saved me more times than you know. Thank you. I love you and I'm so proud of you. My brother, you are my hero. Yeah. <laughs> I love my brother. Yeah. Oh, I get it. I get it. I feel like I can certainly relate in my own experience of the way 
also, I think the different roles that different people have played in this grand unfoldment, you know, of just how important my family was in my leaving and the reparations around that and and present day, you know, the role that they play for me. But then also those that were in the organization that are now best friends that are just a support that is entirely unique, you know, just because they know and can understand and, um, you know, our relationships have grown into so much more, of course, beyond that. But there really is something about having known what the other experienced and lived through. And then those people that, you know, one of my best friends is somebody who I met at work when I was in the group. She loved me through that whole transition of leaving and her whole um, uh, kind of her comments about watching me in that also has just been a perspective that, again, was entirely unique. You know, her kind of commentary of like, well, I knew you and I felt like I knew you. But then when you actually got out, there was just this whole other element that opened, you know, where I could just be free with her. And that wow. also is, you know, such a powerful relationship that, you know, I I just value so much present day. Mm -hmm. It's it's mm -hmm. fascinating the nuances of the ways in which we receive or get buoyed up by you know, the different individuals in our life. It's really. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Do you mind me asking kind of how do you feel now about the relationship or lack thereof uh, with your mother and your sister? Sure. You know, I, I grappled with the lack of relationship with my mother for a, for a very, very long time, especially, you know, I would, I would, people would get to know me and then they would obviously, you know, questions about where you're from and who your parents and, uh, you know, like all those things come up. And then the amount of people who said to me, but she's your mother. Of course she loves you. Of course you love her. You have to repair this relationship. Um, and I would feel so much shame about the disintegration of our relationship um, for, for so long. And then, Around 2007, I went for therapy with an incredible therapist. And um, she, I spoke to her about this and I said, it's so hard for me, you know, when people say, but she's your mother. Of course, you know, she loves you. Um, and my therapist said to me, Erica, if your mother had put you in hospital with a broken jaw or cigarette burns, would they be encouraging you to keep contact with her? And I said, no, of, of course not. Yeah. And she's like, and so? Like, the scars aren't, vis aren't visible. But, and you know, just like that, the shame disintegrated. And these days when someone says to me, oh, she's your mother, you have to. I say to them, you are so lucky that you don't understand my situation because that is a credit to your mother. So go and thank your mother for being an amazing mom that you don't understand my situation and you know what jennifer i have come to realize that i don't like my mother um i have i've seen how she's behaved towards me um for sure i've seen the things that she has said about me um uh, i've heard about the things that she has said about me over the last two three decades and then I've also spoken to people who have left, um, who have told me things about my mother, that it, it's their story, but deeply disturbing. Yeah. Um, and I've realized that I don't like her yeah. and I, my life is better without her in it. I don't want her in my life anymore. Like I fought for so many years to try and have a relationship with her because I thought that was the done thing and that was what was supposed to happen. And now I actually thank my lucky stars that I don't have to speak to her and that I don't have to worry about her and that, you know, so, and of course I still worry about her. I know that she's not well. 
I know that she had COVID. Um, I, you know, I, I, I hear these things from people. Um, but I have zero desire to ever speak to her again. And I made a decision a few years ago that if she ever begged me to come to her dying bedside, I would refuse. I have told her that I forgive her and I'm, and I mean it. She has not, she has said that it's obvious that I haven't forgiven her because I'm speaking out and this activism work, it's obvious that I haven't forgiven her. And I say two things can be true at the same time. Yes. I cannot forgiven you, but I can still want to hold you accountable and want to stop you from harming others. Yes. So um, I don't want to have anything to do with her. My sister is a lot more complicated. I'm going to jump in here for just a moment. We'll be picking up right at this spot as Erica speaks about her sister. It felt like the right timing to share the excerpt from the sermon that Erica refers to, where her mother is in front of the Kwesi Zabantu congregation and denounces Erica. I want to provide a warning here as it was personally very difficult for me to hear. For those of you who don't want to hear something that sounds like biblical teachings, please feel free to forward through. Since I didn't want Erica's mother to have the last word, I do pick up from where we leave off for another few minutes of discussion, where Erica is speaking both to her tender feelings about her niece, as well as the hypocrisy of the environment, and how one of the leaders uses the Bible to preach a message of how not telling the truth can be the right thing to do. It seemed perfect to place that clip after just hearing her mother, as you will hear Erica's powerful commentary. So these were my considerations when editing this three-part series for you. In the clip after her mother's denunciation of her, you will also hear Erica's love for her sister and nieces. The clip itself is 15 minutes. So if you do want to skip ahead, please feel free. And getting back to the clip of Erica's mom, I'll warn that it may also feel terrible to hear scripture used in this way to denounce Erica, prop up her sister, and teach the congregation that, quote, fear of God is appropriate. And furthermore, that it's what should have kept Erica devoted and still living at Kwesizabantu. I purposefully also placed the clip here as it contrasts so well with how thoughtful and considered Erica's process has been regarding where she's landed around her mother. I love that in the interview prior to this clip, we get to hear many of the things that have become my personal experience of Erica. That is, honoring her strength, and maybe as she acknowledges it, more than strength, an honoring of her conviction that she will call out the abuse and stand for the takedown of it. We also get to hear Erica's passion and her feelings that arise as she considers her sister and how this relationship feels in a different place or category for her as she also considers her niece, her sister's daughter or daughters. For myself, all that Erica shares here is so representative of how complex the family layers can be, especially when torn apart by religious and spiritual abuse, interlaced with the horrors of physical and sexual abuse that take place not just for Erica, but for many who were there, and certainly for many who are currently there, including the children. So please take care as you listen, and again, you're welcome to forward through 15 minutes if you'd like to not hear the clip, but would like to hear the last few minutes of what Erica shares, which actually provides a lot of insight into the spiritual abuse that's taken place with her niece and Kwasiza Bantu teachings around Satanism. But for now, this is Erica's mother speaking to the Kwasiza Bantu congregation. We just read when this root of bitterness have grown so that so many were defiled already. But this matter did not only happen in Israel. 
It's right through the history of the church we read about this bitterness. And it can happen in a family, in a home. It happened in my home. And I want to use my two daughters as an example tonight. The eldest daughter served God. And she is with her family and her three children, with her husband and three children, still here at the mission serving the God, with the Lord. But my youngest daughter, who grew up in the same home, who had the same mother and father, who came at the same time to Kwasisabantu mission. She allowed a root of bitterness in her life that she did not deal with. And that root of bitterness grew. So that eventually she could not stay any longer in the home. She could not stay any longer at Kwasisabantu. So she left. And that bitterness in her grew. Now we have noticed that bitterness has the power of the lie within it. And then it paints all the happiness in different colors, not the true color any longer. And that happened in this youngest daughter's life. The bitterness, the lie, the power of the lie entered into this root of bitterness that have grown. And after some years, it burst open into the media. But now, it was so mixed with lies that one could see this bitterness has changed the perceptive of this daughter. It changed her so much that she became a victim in her own mind. So her mother was to blame, others were to blame because there was no responsibility that she had because of these circumstances. And in this victim mentality, because of the root of bitterness, lies were easily spoken. So she said that she was chased away from home. But that's not the truth. She left out of her own. So everything was colored with this bitterness. And she hasn't been home for the past 20 years. But my eldest daughter lived here at home. And she's still serving the Lord in great joy. Because we experience the, the life here at Sisabantu. There's no root of bitterness living in our hearts. 
Ayiki mpande yo baba e pila e njinze tu e tu. No lie. Aweka manga. So we see the people that are being so, so smeared because of bitterness in other people's lives. Manje siya babona bantu aba pikuwa nje ngobe ndi nyama benga izanga. Genga ya lugu baba be pikuwa aba nyenge mpilo zaabu. Raven Stegen's house is still open like always. The glory of God is still seen in his life and on his face as always. These 20 years that this bitter younger daughter has gone away, has nothing has changed. It has just gone deeper and deeper into the love of God. And this um, dear Miss, Miss Dube, Lydia Dube, who is being so, I don't know how to explain, persecuted. So she's a woman, and I think this is the time to abuse women because she is so abused, one can say, by the media, by these bitterness, this root of bitterness that have grown in hearts. But my eldest daughter who stayed behind and her family and I, we go and visit Ms. Dubis in her house. And this um, smearing of her name, all these lies that have been told because of this bitterness, has only succeeded in bringing more glory on her face. The glory of God is seen on her face. Manje lugu kutulela pansi kwe kamala ake na manga kulunyo angaye. And kindness has just deepened in her life. And gentleness. And there's not a sign of darkness in her life. Now just think of it. This daughter who left in bitterness, she's missing all the blessings that we have been experienced for more than for these 20 years that she's been away. And another terrible thing is bitterness drives the fear of God from the heart and therefore it defiles so many people. Korah didn't fear God any longer. He was appointed to carry the holy things of God, to be close to the tabernacle, to look after the tabernacle. But he didn't fear God any longer. He went to Moses one day with his whole gang who has been defiled by his bitterness. And he said, Moses, you've gone too far now. You and Aaron, you are gone too far. We are also holy. But he forgot that that time when God came down on Mount Sinai, he was one of those who begged Moses and said, Moses, we will die if God speak to us any longer. You go, you go, you speak to God. And it is a terrible thing to have a child that has gone away 
from the blessing of God, from the life of God, from the people of God, because of a root of bitterness. Futi wii njep shungu ukuba nengane, e hambile ya shia umusa kankulunkulu, nempilo, enkulunkulu, na bantu baka nkulunkulu ngenga yokbaba. And to see that the, the bitterness has driven the fear of God from that heart who was taught from small to fear God. But I think one of the most scary things of this root of bitterness that grows up that it becomes visible is that the fear of God is so removed that Kora touch the anointed of God. Kuba uguti uwe sabu nkulunkulu kwa se kusuge nga lenze la kukora kwa ze watinda oto chwe uga nkulunkulu. As the sun didn't burn them during the days of our leader who is a righteous man. Si habu uzwa tine si azizu impendu ulo ze mtanda zo yom holu wetu oi mwonto lungile. We experience the prayers, the answer of the prayers of Aunt Mkulu in our very lives. E mpilo nze tuko obo si azizu wa si aiboni impendu ulo ze mtanda zo ka Aunt Mkulu. But those who left in bitterness have no more experience of this beauty, of this wonder of God's work. Kutwa la babashi ya bahamba ngubaba kwa bababe nako abako but Korah went too far in his bitterness. He said to Moses and Aaron, you went too far. You went too far now. But God stopped, put a stop to Korah. Korah the earth just opened up and swallowed him. And he went alive into hell. And just think of it, he is still there today with all these memories. But now the memories are not colored any longer in his own colors by bitterness. Now he's hearing those memories that is attacking him, that is, is um, giving him the deepest, deepest, deepest sorrow because why did he not listen? Why did he not grab the opportunities that God gave him? And he will never be able for all eternity to erase those true memories. So friends, the Bible warns us and says, do not let a root of bitterness grow up. Let us obey the word of God. Let us give ourselves over to this warning and say, Lord, protect me that I would always deal with anything that happens in my life so that there will never, ever grow a root of bitterness in me. Masis nigele tina ngokpelele gule sise kwa iso. Uguze guti nkosi, siti nkosi, magunga mili, magunga nzege pilo ni amigu mile limpande, e babayo, magunga nzege nisebe nzega leso skari. If you happen to meet up with my youngest daughter, you can tell her her mother is still waiting at the foot of the cross. There is still time that the Redeemer can uproot that root of bitterness. And save her life. Shall we pray together? My sister is a lot more complicated. Um, I grieve for the woman that she could have been. Um, I 
yeah, I have a lot of sadness about my sister. Yeah. But none about my mother. I'm glad my mother's not in my life. Yeah. I'm sad for my sister. Yeah. Well, and also with, well, first of all, just to say what a thank you so much for just sharing so intimately that kind of inner journey to where you've been and where you've come to kind of emotionally around it all. And, um, and then also just with your sister, I mean, the thing that really strikes me there, I think maybe I shared this with you when we first spoke that the moment that I had with your book that produced the most emotion and where I started crying was in the moment where you discover that there's this hospital thing happening at Kwasi Zabantu and that your little niece is in this hospital. And, And I think, you know, for me, as soon as I heard that, knowing and understanding the coercion in these group dynamics and how powerful it is and how entrapped it is, knowing that there's that happening and a medical system involved. I mean, that for me is just such a huge red flag where you really you know, you just start to think kind of worst case scenario with those things of these young girls, you know, who are trapped in a hospital type situation. It is just scary. So calling it a hospital is a bit of a misnomer because there's yes. no medical care. Um, and of course, um, they refute that this happened. And um, my brother-in-law, oh, he's such an odious little man. Um he has posted videos on YouTube. Um, you can, you can, people can find it for themselves. Just go look. Erica Boardman's niece speaks out. You know, he has posted videos of his daughter sitting on what's supposedly the hospital bed that she was on. But we all who've been there, we look at that video and we laugh, not at her. Um, but we laugh at the, there's a painting on the wall. Oh my God, has that thing been staged? And you can see the camera like panning. And then suddenly stopping because it, I think the, the, the cameraman realized he can't pan too far because the rest of the room obviously looks very different to the little corner that they have made up. Um, so, so yeah, she, she refutes that any of this happened, but I don't hold that against her. Of course. And I hope that, I hope that she will one day reach out because I will always be there for her. I don't care how old I am or how old she is and my other nieces, how old they are. I will be there for them if they ever want to leave. I will move heaven and earth to get them out of there. But they are adults now, so it has to be their choice. Yeah. Um, so they refute that it happened, but I know that it happened. I mean, there are too many people who know that it happened, <laughs> you know, for them to say, oh, it didn't happen. Uh, bullshit, you know, like pull the other one. We know how much you lie. That's the other thing is they preach that it's okay to lie as long as you're lying to protect God's work. Now, firstly, any God who needs humans to lie for him is not worthy of the title of God. And secondly, you're not lying, Kwasi Zabantu people, if you're listening to this. You're not lying to protect God's work. You're lying to protect Kwasi Zabantu and the evil that they are doing. That is what you're lying about. I mean, to tell, I mean, there's a, there's a, Oh, so when all this investigation, which we'll talk about, that 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 I helped spark, yes. came out, Kwasi Zabantu went on a major mission to scrub um, offending <laughs> services from their channels. <laughs> you know, like the the video where my mother denounces me, for example, isn't on YouTube anymore um, because I write about it in my book. And when my book came out, I went looking for it again the one day, and it had been scrubbed. Uh, but I mean, I downloaded a copy, so we still have it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I think um, we'll share a clip of that. Yeah, but they, but the scrubbers missed one where Aylor actually preaches about how um, you have to sometimes lie, you know, and he uses an example from the Bible. I, I forget the people's names, but some woman duped some well, some dude to come into her tent and she killed him because she'd lied to him and that that she had done such a good thing by lying to him because it helped her save the Israelites or whatever, you know, 
I blank out details about what stories that I now believe are bullshit. Um, <laughs> so they 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 forgot about that. So I've obviously downloaded that entire video so that if they do scrub it, that we still have the record of him um, explaining to his congregation how white people don't get that sometimes you have to lie, you know. So yeah, so so there's this whole weird side to Kwasi Sabantu that people don't know about. Um, and that's going into trances and they are obsessed with um, demons. And um, uh, anyway, there was apparently this list that had been compiled of, of people who were Satanists. Um, I mean, oh. like for crying out loud, how can you be a Satanist when you've, were born and grew up at Kwasi Sabantu. Explain to me how a young woman in her early twenties can be a Satanist. Like, like it doesn't compute anyway, but, um, and that she had, she was on that list and that she had been confined to this mental hospital. Um, she was allowed out to go to church to have meals and she was studying and um, they've got a teacher's training college there and she was studying. She was allowed to do that, but that, but at night and, and um, someone who has left who was living there at the time um, sent me a message via someone else. Um, I don't think they could quite manage to speak to me <laughs> wow. and they said that they are so, so sorry. They would hear her crying and they didn't go and help her. Um, oh. and that was very hard to hear oh. yeah. so I know this happened this happened they are they are saying that it didn't happen but I know that this happened and and we have her confession as well that they have put out there and it's so convoluted where she's saying that she welcomed Satan she gave her life to Satan you know um and as a child, she gave her life to Satan. I mean, like for crying out loud, you know, it, 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 you just listen to her and, and how she's and this, because you have to confess you, 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 when you've been done something horrifically wrong. Like if I had gone back to the mission, I would have had to speak um, to the entire congregation. And this is what she oh. does. She's speaking to the entire congregation. And I mean, that is still on their website. And, um, and you just listen to it and you just realize this this young woman is just so confused and and uh, oh, it freaking breaks my heart it just breaks my heart but and the thing is it's like she's my niece okay so but there are so many there are so many who are not related to me who are living there and they've grown and they know nothing else they know nothing else so how are they supposed to break free? I, oh. We so hope that you enjoyed this episode. And please stay tuned for part of Leaving the Cult, the season two song written by Jaya Suri. And for all things related to Jaya, her music, ways that you can support her, check out the show notes.